Okay, now we're starting part 10 of the Hands-On Big Data workshop series, and this section deals with Tessera. So Tessera is another uh, package that, another software product that works in the R environment. Tessera is a relatively new development. It's a grant-funded project by NSF and others uh, that it has teams out of Purdue, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and Mozilla. Uh, just came out in November 2014, and I think it's a very promising project because it lets you use very simple and familiar R code for people who are, are R users uh, and run that against a full Hadoop cloud uh, data storage structure. So there are uh, only a, a handful of packages that have been developed. The data DR package is the package that handles the data analytics side. Um, there's an R hype package that interacts with Hadoop. Um, you really don't see that. Uh, it's, it's working behind the scenes. You don't interact with it yourself too much. It's the one doing the translation into Hadoop. And then there's a visualization interface called Trelliscope. Now the visualization is really exciting. Uh, you'll see that um, in the live demo in just a second. Um, because there are not too many packages that really handle large data that well. So the Tessera website is very informative. Um, you can go there and learn all about it. Um, under one of those links, uh, there is a boot camp. Now, if you want to go further, if this little taste of Tessera is interesting to you, the boot camp um, links provide more of a, a full workshop just on using Tessera. And there's several exercises and code included here that's quite good. So something to try out, the boot camp. Um, but we're going to look at a, just a few simple examples. So let me uh, explain a little bit how this works. Uh, the data DR package manages the dividing and recombining of data. That's the DR. Now this is really just another way of describing a map reduce type uh, process where instead of map we have divide, instead of reduce we have recombine. So we take our original requests and split them out to the different computing instances in our cluster, dividing them. Uh, things run on each cluster, or requests are made on each, each cluster, uh, each computer in the cluster, and we generate some output there, and then we have to bring it all back together in, in the map reduce environment. That's called the reduce phase in, the, in this uh, environment we call that recombining. And another way to think of data DR is a layer that sits atop these other computing and storage environments making it easy for you to interact uh, with all those things. Now if you want to run these, if you've got an R installation on your local machine, you can just go ahead and install these packages on that local installation and run these, these commands and it's going to run just the same on a local machine as on a full cluster installation because the packages are taking care of the work of translating for you. Um, so it can run on a, on a small amount of data within memory, um, it can run on a local R installation, and it can scale up to run across data on a large cluster and R running in the cloud, which we're going to see. So this diagram kind of explains that for you. All right, I think that's all I'm going to say in, in terms of background. Uh, we're going to actually get in and try to spin up a, a Hadoop cluster. So if you go to um, my GitHub site, Ryan Data Big Data, and take a look at the Tessera, sort of, this is a, a kind of a a little list of commands and instructions that will help you get started. Uh, it's not very um, complete or super organized, but um, this will help you do that. So there is another site on GitHub that has instructions on how to install Tessera on a cluster. If you go to the website, you'll see there's also instructions on 
how to uh, at the at the original Tessera website uh, the the full instructions on installation at your on a local system on a cluster that you control but th this is a shortcut script an experimental script uh, people who are coming back to this video a few months or, or down the road uh, note that that these things may change rapidly and have you know it may work quite differently in a few months than it does in this video because th this is the type of thing that's under rapid development uh, but we can go to the um, EMR 3.2.1 uh, folder uh, that's the, the later version and at that location there's a more complete set of instructions on how to install things. Um, now I'm assuming you know, that you've done some of the work in the previous sessions of this in the previous videos in this series and you have got yourself an Amazon account on AWS uh, you know how to create an S3 bucket for a storage of your data and again just to, uh, to quickly review that if you can log into your Amazon Web Services, go to S3, and simply click Create Bucket. Now I'm going to use for, for this demo right now, I'm going to use one of the ones I recently created called Big Data Bucket 370. But go ahead and create your own bucket. Uh, bucket again is a, a, an, a file location like a directory that's accessible via the Amazon Web Services and so an account, a bucket, access to the Amazon command line interface, a, a key and credentials to use the command line. Now these are all things we did in previous videos. If you need a refresher you're coming to this video uh, later in the sequence. There are instructions uh, on this page about how to go through setting all that stuff up um, and just as a as a little reminder there, um, let me pull up a new a new terminal window. Uh, when you go to aw you've you've installed the Amazon command line, and you type AWS configure, that's where you enter your credentials. Uh, if you've already got this stuff in your system, you've used it for the previous sessions, you should be fine. You don't, you don't have to change anything there. The one thing you do have to be careful about and I've discovered this during a dry run for this video is you have to make sure that your uh, the user that you're going to be running as has permission to work on an elastic map reduce uh, cluster so under in our Amazon Web Services you can check this by going to under your your name for your account go to security credentials um, we can just s click to continue to security credentials, click on users. Uh, now in an earlier video I created a YouTube user, that, uh, that's the one I'm primarily using in these demos. Um, you can even create a new user if you want to, but you're going to have to download credentials for that user uh, if you do. I'll click on the, the user and I want to make sure that I have Elastic Map Reduce full access. Um, so you might come to this screen. I'll just show you how to do that. Uh, I'm I, I just detached the policy. So now I no longer have EMR access. If you see something like this on your screen, go ahead and click Attach Policy. Look in the list for Amazon Elastic Map Reduce full access. Select it and say Attach Policy and that's going to give you enough power with this particular account to create the, the cluster. Okay, so that's uh, setup issues. And now we should be good to go. If you have any authentication issues uh, when you spin things up, go back and consult the, the longer instructions at this install EMR GitHub site. Uh, go down and, and look at the help on setting up your credentials and keys. But right now, we should be able to proceed. So the, the next part in the process is we want to grab the installation scripts. And the way to do that 
is using git. This is the easiest way to do that. Uh, if you don't have git on your system, install git. Now if you're running uh, a Linux variant, you can just go into your package manager and grab it and install it. Um, otherwise you want to look at um, some of the instructions that are up on GitHub or just you know Google some information about installing Git. You don't have to become an expert user of Git right now. You just have to have it installed and run this one command. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Git is a system that helps you manage software and other documents and things that have multiple versions that all need to be sort of synced up across uh, perhaps many contributors to a software project makes it easy to do things like that. So to in order to copy the, the relevant materials, all of the materials from this particular GitHub site, the command for that is git clone and then we just provide the web address of the site that we want to clone. Now you can go into any directory um, I actually already did this in my downloads directory, so if I if I list um, things starting with install, I actually already have it. Um, so I'm not going to repeat running the command um, in this in this video. I installed it during the dry run, but you just enter the command, and there you go. Now, because I already have it installed, it gives me an error that it's already got something in that space that I've downloaded. I could delete that directory and reinstall it. I'm not going to do that right now. Um, but what it does is copy the entire directory over. Then I can go into the new directory. This is install-emr and go into, notice here uh, these are the, the same file structure that's up on the website. Go into the emr 3.2.1 directory or when you come back and do this later it might be a newer version than that. Um, just you, you can go ahead and use the latest version and this is a directory that contains the automated scripts for setting up the cluster. Once we're here in this position we can run the command dot slash tessera emr dot sh for shell and then provide a location for our S3 bucket. So it looks for a storage location you know for some of the miscellaneous operations and that would be uh, let me just clean up some of these extra windows that I keep clicking into. I'll do it here cd emr dot 3.2.1 and paste my command and I'm going to provide the S3 uh, location. So I type S3 colon slash slash and then just the name of the S3 location. So I say big data bucket 370, that's the one I chose to use. Hit enter and it's just going to start spinning up. Um, if your authentication is is working then you're going to be just fine um, with all this. Now it does take a while to set up and while it's setting up I'm going to talk through some other issues. So I've run this a few times and sometimes it manages to complete the entire R um, and R Studio installation on its own we're going to actually see in a few minutes whether that happens this time. Uh, if you encounter any problems like that along the way, uh, you can go to the GitHub site, uh, my GitHub site, which I need to look up again, and my Tessera notes uh, talk about several things that at least I had to do at least a, a couple of times I ran this to finish the R installation. So what's going to happen is you're going to get a cluster that's starting up. We can actually see it in action here. Um, it's creating a Tessera cluster. It's starting. 
Um, that cluster is composed of a few machines. Um, actually, none of them are running yet. It's still configuring. So um, once they're up and running, we're, we're going to see them on our EC2 uh, dashboard as well. And it's going to install a lot of stuff, but it may not finish the R installation. So you may need, you'll, you'll have a working installation, and so you can log into that site, uh, the remote site, just um, use the commands here and do a sudo command that will download the the RStudio server and some dependencies. Um, so this did happen to me a couple of times and so I'm trying to list for you the dependencies here. Uh, this video will turn out to be a little bit longer if that happens on the current instance that I'm running. And if you're doing this on your local machine, um, on a Windows machine, if you're running just R on Windows, it's, it'll take care of these dependencies and things for you for the most part. Uh, the only thing you're going to have to install is uh, dev tools and the data DR and Trello scope packages. I'll circle back around to that in just a minute. Let's see how our process is doing. Uh, we've got some dot dot dots. Uh, that's going to keep going. So I think while that is going, I'm going to talk about uh, my theoretical slides that um, can fit in in this space. And that is high dimensional data and sparse data. We're not actually going to illustrate those with working examples, um, but I wanted to mention those because those are issues that come up a lot in the actual frontiers of research in this area, at least at the present time. All right. So analyzing big data is not only a problem of throwing more disks or throwing more computers at the at the, the problem. There are uh, mathematical issues that um, cause problems in actually computing solutions when you're trying to do data analysis. Now you can store your data and you can you know retrieve your data. This doesn't affect that, but this affects modeling on the data, trying to run a regression, trying to do any kind of predictive analytics, you get into a situation where the models sometimes have, standard models will have difficulties because of the special characteristics of big data. All right, so one major category there is high dimensional data. If we have more variables than observations, that is what high dimensional data is. Uh, variables being p and the number of observations being n. If p is greater than n, we're in this case, high dimensional data. Now you think maybe you've never seen data sets that, that behave that way. Um, you know, normally you've got a few variables and a lot of observations in, say, typical social science work, but it's very common in some fields. So uh, genomics is an area where it's very common. So we when you decode a genome, you identify thousands, maybe 10,000 segments of the genome that are um, areas of interest, areas that we think are distinctive and might have an influence on the ultimate um, you know, life outcomes of, of people. Those are called SNPs or SNPs, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And we might be trying to find out what causes this rare cancer. And it's rare, right? So we only have maybe 100 or so cases of people who definitely you know, died from that cancer. So we've got to take those 100 observations and work with uh, trying to predict something on 10,000 uh, potential variables that presence of these 10,000 different genomes might influence the 100 observations. Um, so we, if you run just a straight regression on that, you know, you get into trouble. Um, a classic method that's been around for a, a while, but is still widely used, 
to deal with that is principal component analysis. So uh, this is a, a method of winnowing down that 10,000 to the a s much smaller set of variables that can explain most of the influence. And it's a, it's a, a more reliable, well-studied way to do that. But this is an active area of research where people are constantly developing refinements and new methods to deal with high-dimensional data. Um, so I just link you to the Wikipedia article there to give you a little bit of background. Um, this is, again, not a <laughs> in any way a detailed theoretical discussion, more of a teaser to give you a sense of some of the issues that are out there at least you've heard of this now and you might want to explore further. Um, the, the packages to deal with principal component analysis, by the way, are PRCOMP in R and in SAS you can just use the PROC factor procedure. So kind of continuing on other methods of, high dimension, of dealing with high dimensional data, uh, a method that was developed um, 20 or so years ago but has become quite um, popular because it, it does very well is called the lasso and I throw you th just because I wanted to throw in um, some math on a slide uh, this is an expression for how we calculate the lasso we're minimizing this expression um, so the lasso does two things at once which not all of these methods will do it reduces the number of variables and tells you uh, these are the most influential variables. So in some modeling, we have a step that says, uh, well, there will be at most 10 influential variables. But then we have to then do a second step to figure out which 10 variables those are. The lasso does both at once. Um, and the, the basic concept here is that we, uh, we're, we're running something like a regression but we're also adding a, a sort of a penalty factor that the more variables we include in the equation, um, that penalty um, discourages us from including a variable uh, that has just a tiny, tiny improvement in prediction or explanation um, versus the cost of, you know, adding this other variable and potentially uh, overfitting the model and not explaining, uh, not providing a good explanation of what the significant factors that explain the, the um, explain the outcome are. Uh, you can see absolute penalty estimation in the International Encyclopedia of Statistical Science, which may be online, uh, available to you online, depending on where you're um, accessing this from. And Lasso came out as a method that is, is now popular and successful and inspired a number of variants for that. So there is a book, Modern Multivariate Statistical Techniques, that can, if you want to go further here, and there's also a book, Statistics for High Dimensional Data, that, that covers that. Uh, I'll show you my uh, references slide at this point. Um, I tend to, I've thrown in a number of Springer titles on this list because at Rutgers, uh, all Springer t titles in math and statistics that have been published since 2005 are available online uh, to Rutgers users and you can download a portable PDF file that you can just have to keep with you. Um, it's not for sharing on the internet because it's marked with you know, who downloaded it uh, at what time, but it is, um, I find it a really useful feature. There's, a, in, especially in statistics, a lot of the important texts come out in Springer, and so it's easy to grab things and study from that. And if you're at an institution that has that Springer package, uh, the, these will be convenient for you to access. I'm not saying that these are the the top titles, that there are not other ways to learn about these topics, but these are the things that I used to put together this presentation. Okay, so you get a sense here, you know, this is an active area of research, and I'm just going to talk about one more topic. Um, 
In the meantime, we'll take a look at our cluster. It's still spinning up, so we have some time to talk and talk about sparse data. All right, so a sparse matrix, I think the Wikipedia definition for this is fine. Uh, a, ma a matrix in which most of the elements are zero. Or you could think about a zero as a not observed or not available um, entry as well. If most elements are non-zero, then the matrix is considered dense. Um, but if, when the fraction of zero elements is large, we have this sparsity. So if we think about, again, maybe a traditional, more social science-y uh, set of observations on a human population, right? We have a, uh, we're, we're looking at, say, income and demographic characteristics of some, some people. We go out, we, we collect that data on 10,000 people. For most, almost all of the 10,000 people, we're able to get that information. We can say they're male or female, what their ethnicity is, um, their income, something about their household size, and we might have a few uh, bits of not available data, something that we couldn't collect, but not a lot. Whereas the typical uh, web type data that's generated by users on the internet, their search behavior, their usage patterns on a website, uh, is going to have a lot of gaps because people do a little bit in one area and they're they don't do much in vast areas. So one classic, uh, by now, sort of a classic example in this area is are the Netflix movie ratings. So Netflix, a few years back, released their complete ratings database of their their users, how they had rated movies, and asked people to figure out um, who could do the best uh, recommendation algorithm for them and would give them a, a prize for that. So you may have heard about that. The link uh, kind of gives you some background on how a particular method that we're about to mention, singular value decomposition, was used for one of the winners of that, that prize. So with the size of the data, 65 gigabytes, um, not massive, but still unwieldy, uh, 480,000 members ratings for 18,000 movies. This is, again, before the, the data was kind of old data for Netflix, and it was before Netflix had grown to, to its current size. Um, but what you have, if you think about a matrix like that, no one has seen all 18,000 movies. And um, someone could go through and click and artificially rate every movie in the database, but that's uh, rare behavior, um, although it could happen. And... For most people, they're going to have you know a handful of ratings for the their own the movies they've seen and a lot of zeros, a lot of blanks uh, there. So once again, mathematically, this is just a situation where you can't uh, handle that with traditional methods. You're just going to generate errors all over the place. So there are techniques to squeeze the zeros out of the matrix and do a compact representation, uh, kind of similar if you think about file compression where uh, you can say, oh, you know, there's a, a string of zeros, f 40 zeros long here. So instead of writing 40 separate zeros, I could just say 40 zeros here and uh, represent the matrix more compactly. So there are, there are R packages that will handle this, which I'm referencing here. And then there are computational techniques that you can run on a sparse matrix. And one that's mentioned a lot and was obviously the winner of the Netflix prize is the singular value decomposition method. Um, and there are packages in R that will do that. Actually, two of them uh, often mentioned SVD and IR IRLBA. So th again, point this out. This is an active area of research. You've now heard about sparse data. And when someone brings that up, you, you can kind of uh, nod your head and say, I know what that is. And if you want to explore more on Amazon Web Services, there uh, it's described at this page at University of Florida, but um, the actual data is accessible via Amazon Web Services, so you can you can play with it with the same techniques we've been using in this workshop. And 
there's a nice visualization as you can see here of those um, images and basically you know it's it's a, a set of data that can be used to experiment on these techniques so I point this out kind of to again hopefully whet some of your curiosity and some of you may pick this up and, and try to learn more about these topics so that's our sparse data how's our cluster doing our cluster is still spinning up uh, I'm gonna take a peek at the Amazon Web Services and I think I will uh, after we take a look at the status let's refresh this page okay now I have three running instances I'm doing better um, these other terminated instances are from earlier uh, jobs but our cluster is a master and two slaves as we've seen in other uh, parts of this demo so those three are up and running and what it's doing now is it's it's completing the process of installing software on those machines and hopefully the fact that it's taking a long time means that it's going to successfully complete the software installation without us having to um, make any further modifications to those machines that's certainly what I'm hoping for all right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the video, and I'm going to come back as soon as the cluster spins up. It may take another five, ten minutes. I'll tell you how long it took uh, when I come back.